Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Lecture 1B, Cost Control in Construction. Uh, so we're going to be uh, starting out uh, looking at some of uh, the tools, techniques that we should be thinking about when we're entering this area of cost control. So we'll be talking today a little bit about risk. We'll also be uh, looking at uh, VUCA, um, which we'll, we'll be discussing and how that impacts our ability to control costs on construction. And how can we use it as a strategy to assist us in controlling costs in our construction uh, projects? And we're going to be looking at all the different areas that impact or potentially can impact our ability to control construction projects. And you're going to see it's quite a lot. So it's kind of like I've discussed in other courses, you know, like the spokes on a bicycle wheel. If something's not quite tuned too well, it can definitely throw a wobble into our project. A wobble being a cost overrun, a time overrun, something that is negatively impacting um, the uh, project goals. And we'll talk a little bit, do a little review on uh, goal structures, because if we're entering into cost control, that is very important to understand because we really have to establish a baseline in our costs as we move forward in the project so that we can measure and we can see the variances that we are occurring and where they're occurring. And we can sort of dive more deeply into determining, well, how do we correct it uh, as we move forward? And uh, how can we build that back into our systems as a business or as individuals so that we don't keep making the same mistakes over and over again? So those are some of the things that we'll be looking at in today's lecture. Uh, and when we think about project management, and I know this is something I bring up very often is, you know, uh, there's reactive and there's proactive management. Well, reactive is something's happened and we're trying to fix it. A lot of things in cost control, quite frankly, do come up in reactive management. Um, something has occurred and now we're trying to look at, well, how do we get this time back without it costing so much extra money and where else can we make savings so we can still hit our targets? That's a reactive sort of process. Um, so part of cost control definitely is that you're in the reactive mode. Proactive is, well, did we have to have this happen? And how can we stop this from potentially happening again? And is there something we can do in our systems, in our education processes, in our training, uh, in our contractual requirements, uh, in our methodologies to mitigate this or to prevent this and be proactive about this? Um, so really this comes up again when we are talking about cost control, this aspect of reactive and proactive. And as you can sort of tell by my text, reactive we want to try to minimize and proactive we want to try to maximize. Uh, in the case of this course, we are going to be in a certain amount of reactive modes and how to deal with that the most effectively, effective way possible or the most proactive way possible. But we can go back to the very beginning, which we will, uh, in setting uh, baselines and uh, estimates and having a, an effective budget to begin with helps us and having some contingencies in place so that we haven't taken too optimistic a view that everything is going to go just perfectly because we're kind of setting ourselves up if we think that is the case in a uh, world uh, where we have a lot of things going on and that brings me to VUCA. Uh, which is uh, vol volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, or volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguitous um, environments. And it really is uh, something that was um, developed by the um, Navy SEALs, and it's been adopted widely by business environments. You can look at the Harvard Business Review. They've had a number of articles on it. Uh, and it, it, it's... I think a really good tool, and as I said in this course, we're going to look at a variety of different tools, techniques, and mental models that you can use to um, better improve your project management processes and be more effective at uh, controlling costs on your project. So I'm taking a kind of um, 
view of uh, breadth in this course uh, that you may not see in a typical uh, sort of cost control uh, course where it just gets very sort of myopically focused on those elements. And I think that can be somewhat of a mistake because construction is a very integrated process oriented um, methodology involving many, many parties and many supply chains and a lot of moving balls. And I think we have to take a more, um, a more holistic approach uh, to how we cost control, implement cost control and cost control systems in our projects. So um, getting to our tool here, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And of course, you know, being 2021 and uh, going forward, uh, we do um, live in a pretty volatile world where there is a lot of volatility going on. And it's important to understand too that we can't necessarily predict every eventuality. It's, you know, we often don't think that way. We, we really should be thinking somewhat in the, the realm of probabilities. Even something that is pretty known to you as a project manager in construction, this is how this goes. There is a probability that it won't go that way for a variety of reasons. Even something that you're really good at, um, there can be something that actually goes wrong. You can think about it, uh, the Seattle Seahawks a few years back. I like the NFL and Seattle um, has been my team only because I really kind of like the coaching aspect that Pete Carroll uses uh, in that um, in on that team. And uh, he made a call uh, and they were, I think it was on the one yard line and um, it was for um, Russell Wilson to throw instead of to hand off the ball. And he threw and it was intercepted. And this was near the end of the game. If they scored, they win. If they don't score, they lose, right? And so, of course, the newspapers picked up on this the next day. What a disaster. What a crazy move by the coach, etc. Well, if you looked at the probabilities, it wasn't such a bad call, right? You're looking at the outcome instead of the probabilities after the fact. Because uh, Russell Wilson very rarely would throw an interception. Very, very rarely throw an interception. And so and it was a little bit of a surprise call. You might get the other team off guard. If it scores a touchdown, he's a hero. Uh, you make him, the outcome's different, then it was a really, really bad call. So you can think about that in a lot of things. And we'll talk about that more in this course, decision-making processes and how we review um, decisions. But there's a certain amount of volatility it wasn't 100% that Russell Wilson throws and it's going to be a complete pass. You know, if it's 95%, that means five times out of 100 when he throws the ball, it's going to be intercepted. It was actually even less than that, right? Because he's a really good quarterback. But um, it does mean it's not a 100% move, right? Running back, uh, Marshall Lynch, fantastic running back. Well, you give the ball to him and it was like, I think, second down. Uh, you could keep giving the ball to him and surely he's going to get that that one yard, but maybe not. He could fumble the ball too. Um, so there, there's everything is with probabilities and there's not 100% certainty. So this is where we get into VUCA, where it's bringing in these different elements and trying to understand that. And it might, makes you a better project manager because it also helps you to settle down a little bit and know, you know, we can't control any everything, uh, but we can play out certain decisions and probabilities and minimize some of the things that can go wrong. And then also we have to develop skills that we're very agile and adaptable that we can respond to things that are, as you'll see in these slides, are unknown unknowns. Um, so definitely there's volatility in our fast changing world. Uh, we can have you know huge supply chain interruptions uh, in construction. There's been lots of interruptions this uh, during this uh, period of time. You, you just have to think of all the players that are involved in all the supply chains of all the materials going through a construction project and something interrupts the critical path, longest path through the project. Again, this is tying a lot of courses together, a lot of different aspects of construction together, cost control does. And that all of a sudden interrupts your ability to finish the project on time. Now you've got a per diem cost. Every day you're on the project, there's a certain cost that's, that's going up. And that's ringing your 
uh, costs out of control. So volatility is definitely something that we deal with in construction. And what we want to do, obviously, is to minimize the volatility. And some of that will be in our uh, how well prepared we are and how well we respond to some things that occur on our um, projects as well. Remember I said some of this is going to be reactive for sure. We want to be as proactive as possible, but then we do have to be reactive because there is volatility that we ne don't necessarily have control over. And those things impact cost. Um, uncertainty. And so uncertainty is that we, as I mentioned, we're not certain that we can't necessarily predict 100% of the outcomes. Probably poker is one of the best games to look at with decision making um, because there's not absolute certainty. Chess, you know, for those of you that are, are like master chess players, then you kind of know that if you make the right decisions all the way through, you're going to win. Usually when you trip up and you make it, it's a mistake or somebody else is a little bit more adept at you and has figured out what you're doing and has developed a strategy around that, it's, it's much more predictable that at the end of the day, the best player is going to win. Um, poker, there's probabilities, right? Now you need, if you're going to, you can master po poker that you can win more times than you lose and then you can become a professional. But you could lose to a hand to somebody else, any one particular hand to somebody else based on probabilities. Like probability should be you should win this hand. 99% of the time with these cards, you should win and you still lose, right? Um, so there's some, there's some level of uncertainty and how big is that uncertainty? It depends what it is. It depends in poker what your cards are. Uh, but on a construction project, it depends on a number of factors of what we're looking at, right? Um, so trying to have some understanding of that, and we'll look at some of those tools uh, in the course as well. We'll talk about pre-mortems and, and, and things of that nature that we can do to try to expose some of these potential issues. And then we can assign some risk probabilities and we can include some... Um, cost buffers uh, in our actual budgets for these kind of things that occur. And then we can also deal with some of the unknown, unknown things that may occur too. Is there absolute certainty? There is not. And so that's part of understanding that aspect uh, in um, VUCA and in projects that we um, tend to run. Complexity, well, how complex is what we are doing, right? And the more complex, uh, the more uh, the more chances there are that something can have sort of a ripple off effect. Uh, probably a good example is the um, Challenger disaster, and you know the the research reports that they did afterwards on that, and a lot of it had to do with um, the probabilities and the complexity of the systems, and not full accounting for that complexity in the systems. Uh, in, from safety protocol um, uh, requirements. So complexity plays a role. And, you know, when you think about construction projects, uh, the level of complexity can be quite different. You know, if I'm doing a kitchen renovation compared to an Eglinton uh, Crosstown LRT system, subway system, uh, where there's a lot of things that are in the ground, there's a lot of unknown unknowns, there's a lot of moving balls at once where there can be more of an opportunity for something that would be a negative event to occur, right? So levels of complexity. Also, there's thinking about, well, if I do X, then Y should happen. But if I do X, maybe Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F can also happen, right? So looking at first order consequences, the probabilities of that, and also second and third order consequences plays into um, complexity. Ambiguity is where we think that it's not clear um, or certain, like we talked about uncertainty, but there's there's not 100% um, clarity on what, and that, that might occur where we have um, something that uh, is new, uh, that we're trying out, and we don't have any source of comparable information for this. 
So we might want to alleviate some of those issues uh, by doing some pilots, some trials, checking as we go. So being a little bit more tentative with something and seeing how that works, getting looking for feedback with it rather than going all in in the wrong direction on something. I think uh, Jim, Jim Collins has referred to that in uh, Good to Great, not uh, Good to Great, but in some of his further um, books and materials as, you know, you sort of have a, a shot, a company takes a shotgun and they try a bunch of different things and they, they haven't made a massive investment in any one thing and they get feedback and they see this is, looks like it's going to work really well and then they start investing in that more as opposed to a cannonball where you put all of your eggs in one basket and you fire it and then if you miss you're done um, so uh, ambiguity uh, comes into play when we talk about VUCA in that way and um, because it's something new uh, or disruptive in some sort of way like we talked about how change occurs in the previous lecture lecture 1a um, there's unknown unknowns and so what does it what does VUCA mean for us working in construction? I think it's helpful to understand that there is this aspect in our environment and we can't control everything. Um, it gives us, though, a little bit of an awareness of what's going on in our surroundings. You know, if you're into uh, Marvel Comics a little bit, uh, a spidey sense of something that's going on because we, we understand that we're not in total control of things. Um, we understand that change is going to occur. So the Eisenhower quote, plans are nothing, but planning is everything. It just means that we know that we're going to have to adjust and we're going to project management is iterative. Cost control is iterative. When we go outside certain parameters, we want to try to bring things back. So that means we have to replan. We have to adjust. And that's where you get this term agile thinking coming in, lean thinking as well. Um, so because lean thinking is really about reducing variation, variability, so that we can improve predictability, so we can improve reliability. And that means that if we do an estimate and we do a project and we are much more reliable and predictable, then we've got our costs under control. And then we're going to hit our profit targets that we had outlined in the original estimate. That's cost control. Uh, so collect data that's reasonably accurate. Data is very important. It doesn't have to be 100%, but you want it to be reasonably accurate that you can count on it when you're making decisions. Um, and of course, we want to make sure that we have systems that are in place so that we can repeat our successes and we can collect the data in a effective and cost effective and time effective manner that will help us to achieve the goals that we set. And we've looked at this in previous uh, studies and it comes up no matter where you look at it in construction, time, cost, quality, safety, and scope. So really we can call these constraints as a project management institute would do, but we can also call them goals, all right? that helps us towards the, that end. So when we think about VUCA, there's also certain elements within VUCA uh, that you know we can tie to what I would call the unknown dilemma or the unknown unknown dilemma and how to be proactive. And um, so there is this quote that uh, was done. Uh, really, I think if you go back far enough from it, uh, it really came sort of out of NASA. Uh, but if you look more recently, probably uh, Nassim Tlaib um, in The Black Swan is credited for a lot of it. And then it's even been quoted by uh, Donald Rumsfeld uh, as well, if you're looking into it. But really, PMI too, same idea. Um, there's no knowns. These are the things we know we know. So we're confident in this. You've done a construction project a certain way. You know how to do this. This is the way that you go about doing things. That's the known knowns. Uh, there's the known unknowns. Well, you've looked at it, and so really a risk is a known unknown. We, we are doing this um, particular project, and we know that we have some uh, particular uh, potential for risk in this area. Uh, there may be an underground stream in this area. We may have some uh, water uh, difficulties in this excavation, but we we have a good idea about it. We've done some testing in advance. 
So it's a known, we're not exactly sure how much problems that it's gonna cause, but we built contingencies around that. So we're not gonna to be totally surprised when we run into an issue with it. So that'd be a known unknown, something that we have taken the time and effort to um, look at the potential risk that's involved, quantify it, put in some buffers into it, put into some contingencies for it. It's really about understanding, you know, what is the risk we are taking? right? So having a good understanding of what the risk is that we're taking and what's the downside, right? Like if we fall, are we finished? Do we have a fall arrest system? If not, we are done. There's a very, very high risk. Um, so risk in the unknown dilemma. Unknown unknowns are something that we don't know that we don't know. Um, and uh, they're also re typically referred to as black swan events. Uh, so, you know, we don't want to have something be an unknown that could have been a known unknown. Um, so from that perspective, we wouldn't want to have, so if we're doing work in a building and it's built in the 1950s and 60s and we open it up and it's asbestos, we're not calling it, oh, there's no way I could have known that that would be there. Well, you could have known that it would be likely somewhere in that building because most buildings built in the 1950s and 1960s are going to have asbestos in them. You know, if it was built in 2015 or something, yeah, that might be a surprise that you had uh, asbestos in it somehow. But uh, something that was pretty easy to figure out, right, should have been dived into and moved into this category, planned for and budgeted for. But unknown unknowns still happen. You still get things like this sinkhole that occurred uh, in Ottawa when um, the LRT was being built, right? And they're still not even sure whether that was vibration that was nearby or whether a water main just went. Um, it's only that the LRT was nearby. And so, of course, everybody wants to jump on and say that that was the issue. It may not have been the issue. Um, so, but that's an unknown unknown. There, didn't know that that possible pipe would break with some local vibration or whether it would just go on its own and the damage that it might do in that short period of time. Um, so you definitely want to have some contingencies in projects though for some bit of unknown unknown. You may not have enough of a contingency or it may be something that you won't be faulted with at the end of the day, but still that you have to act upon to rectify the situation. I always remember this, um, when this occurred, I was actually doing some training out in Ottawa uh, on the LRT aspect. And I remember this happened and this was like really big deal. This was like Young and Dundas. So this is right by the Rideau Center uh, in downtown Ottawa. And this is like Young and Dundas in Toronto or Times Square in New York, whatever you want to look at it. And um, within about a week, like came back and it was like, you'd, you'd be hard done by to tell that this ever happened. Like that's how quickly it was moved upon. So um, that was uh, just showing these things do occur, but you do have to be in construction prepared to be able to respond to these types of things. So uh, black swan uh, theory um, is, as I mentioned by uh, um, uh, Nicholas Tlaib uh, in the black swan book, um, is something that is an outlier. Uh, you can't predict it ahead of time, but after it happens, you can justify why it happened pretty easily. All right. But usually ahead of time, you can't predict it, that this would have happened exactly. He usually uses the 2008 financial crisis as an example. Very few people were able to predict it. And probably if you statistically looked at the people that predicted it, it was very, 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 very small amount that somebody would have guessed it just looking at that that way. Um, just because they have the right outcome doesn't mean they necessarily use the right methodology in figuring it out. There was occasional ones, but um, it was very interesting. I found uh, his view on the pandemic. Uh, he actually wrote about it that the pandemic was not a black swan because enough people, there was enough warnings of this sort of thing happening and governments definitely weren't prepared for it. Uh, but I don't know any government that would have necessarily been able to time it, but I de definitely believe that most governments could have been better prepared for that uh, in, in that way. So he doesn't call that a black swan, but I would say it was a black swan for anybody in a leadership position in government uh, and, you know, CDC and a whole bunch of other WHO uh, that uh, didn't 
actually have enough systems in play to actually um, respond effectively um, to it. But as far as predicting it, um, I don't think that that was necessarily to a time period predictable, but an understanding that that could happen and the repercussions, I don't think the full impact of second order, third order, fourth order consequences were truly understood. So it gets you thinking about things in that perspective. Uh, so, you know, whether we're talking about uh, those types of things or whether we're talking about construction related types of black uh, swan events, which do occur. But as I, I said, the goal should be on the proactive side to make sure that something that is more a, of a known unknown is kept in that realm. All right. And that's a big deal because we do end up with a lot of unknown unknowns that really shouldn't have been in that area that really were known unknowns as Nassim uh, um, Talib would mention uh, regarding the um, pandemic, right? That should have been better vetted and understood better contingencies in place for that to have managed that better. Bill Gates has been talking about that for a number of years prior to it occurring, right? So it wasn't like totally unknown. So those are some of the ways that um, I would think about um, the unknown aspect and the unknown um, dilemma all right and some things that you might want to think about you know regarding trying to pull some of that information out and it does take a village when we're talking about figuring some of these out it takes a project team to figure a lot of the potential uh, issues that can come up on a project so that we can make sure that it becomes a known unknown and not an unknown unknown. Everybody has blind spots in their thinking. So collaboration and construction is very important. Otherwise, cost control goes out the windows when you've got unknown unknowns that should have been known unknowns that don't have proper contingencies in place during your budgeting process. And then very quickly, you are going to be over budget on your project if you're taking a totally optimistic view on how the project um, should be run and a lot is you know asking effective questions later in the course we'll talk about the five whys and trying to dig deeper into a better understanding of what occurred on a particular project and why and it can also improve our predictability in those areas as well so these are just some points here that I'm mentioning over uh, coming the unknown um, dilemma all right so we'll all all the unknowns be figured out? No, um, not likely. Uh, so that's why you're still going to need some contingencies in place. But if you greatly reduce them, you're greatly improving your product, your probability of success in managing your projects effectively. And again, there's no 100% in project management, but you can definitely improve your odds and your probabilities to be reach a much higher level of success by following a lot of these practices and using a lot of these tools in developing your strategy for how you want to manage your project and how you want to manage your goals in time, cost, quality, scope, um, safety. And any one of these, well, cost is pretty clear that it affects um, your dollars, but time, things take longer, things tend to cost more. Quality, if you have to redo things that you shouldn't have to redo, cost control goes out the window. You're, you're gonna be over budget. You have massive safety issues, shutdowns by the Ministry of Labor, you have uh, injuries on your site. This is gonna have a huge impact from a financial perspective, not just the ethical side and the moral side of things. So we should develop a risk log that we list the risks that we see on a project. We should categorize them based on probability and potential cost implications. Um, we should validate that and ensure that we've accounted for that in our budget. You know, some things have a very low probability, um, low cost impact. Some things have a low probability, high cost impact. We'll look at this later in the course. Some things have a high probability, low cost impact. Um, so we have to look at how we interpret this and how we best budget for this, right? And we want to look at it and revise it on a regular basis because as we move into a project, we get more detailed and more higher, higher likelihood of accuracy 
the information improves as we move into a project. The further we are away from it, the less accurate we tend to be. And of course, that involves developing a contingency reserve to address known unknowns and a management reserve to address unknown unknowns. So a contingency reserve is for the known unknown. These are the things that we know that could potentially happen that we've looked at from a cost and probability perspective and we've assigned a reasonable budget to, right? The management reserve is something that's above the overall budget that we have in place for these unknown unknown things. If you think you're going through a whole project and something that you didn't expect is not going to occur, you're, you're in for a surprise because there's always some unknown unknowns that will come. And if you've got nothing, then that means you are eating into your profit. So that's what we call a management reserve to address the unknown unknowns. And a contingency reserve is we've kind of addressed things that we've identified and probabilities and costs, and we've put into an overall budget this contingency reserve. It doesn't mean we've added them all up and we've got this huge, ginormous reserve, but we put an allocation that's representative of the probabilities and the costs, and that's not going to throw us that we don't even get these projects, but we do have a contingency in place for it. So this is necessary if we're going to effectively control costs, because we have all of our costs exactly what they are. And as soon as something is not exact and we're over and we have no kind of reserves in place, then yeah, you're going to end up losing money on most of your projects. So to achieve the goals, and we, you know, you can check uh, some of my other um, videos on this, but, and we've discussed this in previous videos, specific, measurable, agreed, realistic, time-based. All right. So these are our SMART goals methodology in developing our goals and this helps us to have clarity on them and be much more likely to be able to be successful and so part of that measurable you know what how are we doing as it goes along this is big in cost control right we've got to have a baseline budget we've got to have a baseline schedule they work together and then we have to measure how we're doing along our original baseline and look for variances when we have a variance, then we have to try to figure out what's causing the variance. So really, we, when we design the control system, um, the purpose is uh, to correct errors. It's not to punish people. It's really to understand where we have issues and we want to improve the reliability of the system, of the information and we want to reduce variability. And this gets into the whole aspect of lean construction methodology, which we will discuss further in the course as well. We also have to have an effective system. That means that we're not going crazy that we're spending an inordinate amount of time trying to save a few pennies uh, when it's costing more time and effort to save those pennies. It has to be a realistic system that is efficient enough that it, you know, I'm not trying to spend four hours to save two dollars. I say that because I've been involved in some projects and the systems are really, really detailed. And I can remember one where I overbilled on the H HST and it must have taken me three hours and the accountant on the other side three hours to sort it out because it was in a different province, different HST amount. And I think at the end of the day, it worked out to about four dollars. So I spent three hours, they spent three hours and we clarified it and I had to take four dollars off my invoice. And OK, so um, you have to look at uh, time and returns. Some things you have to do, but I'm, it's something to consider, too. So we also have to be careful that we're not stifling. Anytime we have processes and systems, we might be stifling creativity and in innovation. So if we have too many tight controls, it limits people's ability to do things and to respond quickly to things that are happening or to maybe be creative and innovative, that can be problematic too. So we've got to be careful when we design the system that it's, it's reflective of that. And we want to not um, only emphasize short term, we want to look at our exposure to long term, right? So something that could save us really good now, but 
falls apart during the warranty period and now we have to go back and fix it and it costs like three times as much to fix it at that point, you would have been better to spend the extra money now and fix it right so that you don't have to deal with it uh, a year and a half from now when it's still under warranty and then we have to pay for it. That doesn't really make sense. So we have to look at um, short-term results and we have to compare to our long run objectives. And maybe in the same period, we sort of, we save a few dollars, but there's the stuff that's not so measurable, uh, that's more um, subjective, that the client is really upset with us because this thing fell apart and it's costing them a lot of money. Sure, we're fixing it, but in the meantime, we've kind of wrecked the brand or the relationship with that client. And was it really worth saving that amount of money in doing that? So you have to think about those things too when we think about cost control. So cost control really is a system of comparing actual uh, construction costs to budgeted construction costs. And it really entails going from the very beginning of a project right through the whole project. And so we have to have a cost baseline or budget based on the project estimate. We have to look at the variations from the baseline as we move through. We have to look at how we can recover effectively any budget overruns, the risk mitigation that we were just discussing, you know, have some contingencies in place, uh, contingency reserve and a management reserve, uh, reduction elimination of waste, because that can definitely help us to control our costs, and continuous learning um, so that we can, if we're partway through the project and we've learned something, how do we implement that on the rest of the project to help better control our costs? How do we implement that across the organization so that we can be um, competitive uh, uh, in bidding on other projects? Our greatest ability to influence costs comes at the earliest point that we have influence on the project. And some of that ties to the contract type that we're dealing with. So depending on the contract type, when do you become involved? You know, are you involved in the design process? Is it a construction management contract? Is it a design build contract? Or is it a lump sum project and the designs are already completed? Regardless, your ability to uh, influence costs um, is much better earlier. Once you're in the middle of the project or you started construction in the project, then it's gonna cost a lot more. So it's gonna be not as easy to fix things. The design is already done. You started to construct it. Now to fix this issue, the savings tends not to be as um, opportunistic. So that does mean in the pre-construction process, in the planning process, vetting things really well, planning things really well, setting up an effective cost control system can be very, very helpful uh, in saving on costs. So if we're really talking about influencing costs, sooner is better than later. That's a theme that you'll see throughout the course. Really, when we think about uh, the management cycle of a business, and this is a typical management cycle of a business and what we do, you know, we've got our mission and our vision of where we want to take things. And then we develop that strategic plan. We plan and organize ourselves. We deploy the resources. We engage and motivate people. We assess the results. We identify the gap. This is how businesses run. But you know what? This is also how we get into a cost control process. We develop a strategic plan. We've basically procured this particular project. We develop our goals and our budgets. We contract with all the various players that's going to be involved in this project. We try to engage them so that they work the most efficient, effective way possible. We measure the result. This ties to lean and uh, the Toyota production system and quality control and PDCA, plan, do, check, act. And then we identify the gaps and we keep going around with this. This is very much like uh, our projects as well. Not only is it from a company business at a, at a macro level, it's also at a micro project level basis. So we have our projects, we have our establishment of our baseline schedule and our cost structure. 
we start the project and we start doing it and we go around implementing and updating and monitoring and replanning the work all right as eisenhower said planning is nothing uh, the plans are nothing but planning is everything because that's an ongoing iterative process and then we're working towards this project closeout of meeting our goals and this is going to require all of these aspects a lot in this course is going to be in this particular um, realm right updating monitoring revising which helps to lead to control and so i just put this together just so that we could just sort of take a high level view of all the things that we have to be kind of cognizant of in this particular course you know we've got our site management and project management team for our project we've got pre-construction we've got construction we've got closeout so these are sort of different stages of a project and we kind of go from one stage to another stage to another we move towards those stages and of course the management team has to organize and coordinate all these specific areas and in these areas we've got leadership we've got relationships we've got ethics that we have to deal with and communication and vision and understanding of where we're trying to take things we've got relationship sales negotiation mission engagement that we just mentioned we want to work from a high moral perspective with integrity values reputation character all of these things lead into the, the project management team, which have to feed out towards the processes that we're doing. Then we've got all these things that come into play. And as I was mentioning, if we mess up on some of these things, they are going to affect our ability to successfully deliver the project that we make it in a cost effective way. So in pre-construction, we've got a lot of things to consider. And there's more than this, right? There's more than this. We'll really hone in and baseline schedule and baseline budgets on this particular um, course here. Um, but there's a lot that is coming through. And this baseline budget, by the way, is coming from our original estimate, which I don't even have on this screen, the procurement process of trying to secure the project. And then we're going to move into construction where we're actually updating and we're trying to recover time and cost. We're looking at productivity execution. If we're not being productive, things are costing more. If we're failing inspections, things have to be done again. We want to make sure that we're monitoring our cash flow effectively so that we're not paying additional financing costs needlessly, that our schedule of values is done well. Uh, quality control, right? That leads to rework if we don't do that well, and that leads to huge extra costs commissioning process if we don't do that well we might miss our closing date we miss our closing date then we have extra costs so we could go around this and look at each one of these particular areas and see some of the issues that go on at closeout we've got um, all of these things to final things out to close it up so that we can finish this project and move on to the next project so how well we start here is going to have an impact on how well we do here and here a lot of the things we need to do here has to be started over here so we'll be looking at these particular areas in this course and beyond and how they integrate together in effectively managing your um, projects and your costs and as i mentioned with this arrow there's the aspect of trying to procure the projects and then there's post-construction. You know, there's things that go on after you've closed out the project. Maybe you have to come back to fix something. Maybe you're getting new work from this particular client to redo certain things, but you're getting paid for it on additional contracts, all of these types of things um, that, that pull in. So this would be what I'd call a tool, a mind map of thinking about the construction process and then thinking about cost control and how it integrates. And as I said, we want, we want to take a holistic view of projects. So that's what I wanted to go over today. Uh, this is Tom Stevenson signing off for now and we will see you next time. Have a wonderful day.